This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Our first reader, I believe, is Eric Falci, who joined the English department at Berkeley in the fall of 2006, where he specializes in modern Irish literature and contemporary poetry. Eric. I am going to read a, the last part of a long poem by Seamus Heaney, and the poem's called Station Island, and, and I'll just explain it really quickly. Um, Station Island is a famous pilgrimage site in Ireland. It's also called as Loch Derg, and it's associated with St. Patrick, and so people would go on the kind of three-day pilgrimage and do the stations, okay? And they, they would pray around these sort of stone beds, which are thought to be the kind of remnants of min, medieval monastic cells. And along the way, this turns into kind of a, dream, a set of dream visions for the poet figure, speaker, peeny figure, whatever. Um, and he runs into figures from his own past, figures from Irish literature, figures from Irish history, and it sort of becomes kind of, sort of Dante-like in the way that he keeps kind of running into the dead. Um, and this is the last section in which he's confronted by um, the ghost of James Joyce. Like a convalescent, I took the hand stretched down from the jetty, sensed again an alien comfort as I stepped on ground to find the helping hand still gripping mine. Fish cold and bony, but whether to guide or to be guide, I, guided, I could not be certain for the tall man in step at my side seemed blind. Though he walked straight as a rush upon his ash plant, his eyes fixed straight ahead. Then I knew him in the flesh out there in the tarmac among the cars, wintered hard and sharp as a blackthorn bush. His voice eddying with the vowels of all river rivers came back to me, though he did not speak yet, a voice like a prosecutor's or a singer's, cunning, narcotic, Mimic, definite as a steel nib's downstroke, quick and clean. And suddenly, he hit a litter basket with his stick, saying, Your obligation is not discharged by any common right. What you must do must be done on your own, so get back in harness. The main thing is to write for the joy of it. Cultivate a work lust that imagines its haven like your hands at night dreaming the sun in the sunspot of a breast. You are fasted now, lightheaded, dangerous. Take off from here, and don't be so earnest. Let others wear, wear the sackcloth and the ashes. Let go, let fly, forget. You've listened long enough, now strike your note. It was as if I had stepped free into space alone, with nothing that I had not known already. Raindrops blew in my face as I came to. Old father, mother's son, there is a moment in Stephen's diary for April the 13th, a revelation set among my stars. That one entry has been a sort of password in my ears, the collect of a new epiphany, the feast of the holy tundish. Who cares, he jeered, anymore. The English language belongs to us. You are raking it dead fires, a waste of time for somebody your age. That subject people stuff is a cod's game, infantile, like your peasant pilgrimage. You lose more of yourself than you redeem doing the decent thing. Keep at a tangent. When they make the circle wide, it's time to swim out on your own and fill the element with signatures on your own frequency. Echo soundings, searches, probes, allurements, elver gleams in the dark of the whole sea. The shower broke in a cloudburst, the tarmac fumed and sizzled. As he moved off quickly, the downpour loosed its screens round his straight walk. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Dan Blanton. He joined the faculty at Berkeley in fall of 2005 from the English department at Princeton. He concentrates primarily on modern poetry with excursions across 19th and 20th centuries. Please welcome Dan Blanton. I was slightly torn between um, 
a couple of texts here. The first I considered was a late poem by um, T.S. Eliot, the last of a sequence called the Ariel Poems, um, which fit the occasion in at least one way uh, that it marks in remarkable fashion uh, the closing of summer and the completion of, in this case, uh, a Journey by Sea, a poem's called Marina. Um, unfortunately, it also seemed a little morbid for the occasion, um, <laughs> which is rather a hazard of dealing with T.S. Eliot. Um, <clears throat> so I think I'm going to go a different direction, though a related one, um, and read a poem published just a few years earlier by uh, the uh, French Caribbean poet Saint Jean Perse, uh, the um, pseudonym of uh, Alexei Leger, which is translated by Eliot and so maintains a bit of that uh, voice. <clears throat> um, the poem is called Anabaz, or in English, Anabasis, referring, of course, to the classical Greek text uh, of Xenophon. Um, and the story of the journey of the army of the 10,000 uh, that didn't necessarily end all that well. Um, that text is, is obliquely uh, imagined here. Um, but Paris does a remarkable thing, uh, I think, captured uh, in the austere style of Eliot's English, of extracting from that source uh, its governing tropes and uh, sort of presiding conceptual vocabulary um, in a way that also perhaps fits the occasion uh, in the marking of the founding of a new year. Mm -hmm. I have built myself with honor and dignity have I built myself on three great seasons and it promises well the soil whereon I have established my law. Beautiful are bright weapons in the morning and behind us the sea is fair, given over to our horses this seedless earth delivers to us this incorruptible sky. The sun is unmentioned, but his power is amongst us, and the sea at morning, like a presumption of the mind. Power you sang as we march in darkness, at the pure idea of day, what know we of our dream, older than ourselves. Yet one more year among you, master of the grain, master of the salt, and the commonwealth on an even beam. I shall not hail the people on a, of another shore. I shall not trace the great burrows of towns on the slopes with powder of coral. But I have the idea of living among you, glory at the threshold of the tents and my strength among you, and the idea pure as salt holds its Aziz in the light time. So I haunted the city of your dreams, and I established in the desolate markets the pure commerce of my soul among you, invisible and insistent as a fire of thorns in the gale. Power you sang on our roads of splendor and the delight of salt. The mind shakes its tumult of spears. With salt I shall revive the dead mouths of desire. Him who has not praised thirst and drunk the water of the sands from a salad, I trust him little in the commerce of the soul. And the sun is unmentioned, but his power is amongst us. Men, creatures of dust and folk of diverse devices, people of business and of leisure, men from the marches and those from beyond, O oh, men of little weight in the memory of these lands, people from the valleys and the uplands and the highest slopes of this world to the ultimate reach of our shores, seers of signs and seeds and confessors of the western winds, followers of trails and of seasons, breakers of camp in the little dawn wind, seekers of watercourses over the wrinkled rhyme of the world, O seekers, O finders of reason, to be up and be gone. You traffic not in assault more strong than this, when at morning with omen of kingdoms and omen of dead waters, swung high over the smokes of the world, the drum of exile waken on the marches, eternity yawning on the sands. In a comely robe among you, for another year among you, my glory is upon the seas, my strength is amongst you, to our destiny promise this breath of other shores. And there, beyond the seeds of time, the splendor of an age at its height on the beam of the scales. Calculations hung on the flows of salt, there at the sensitive point on my brow where the poem is formed, I inscribe this chant of all a people, the most rapt God drunken, drawing to our dockyards eternal keels.
Melanie Abrams, I'm glad to say, is no stranger to the use of microphones in the library. She's been with us many times. She teaches creative writing in the English department, and her first novel, Playing, was published last year. Melanie. Okay, so our job was to choose our favorite poem, which is clearly an impossible task. So um, I decided to choose one of my favorites from when I was in college. Uh, and then we had this incredibly hot day, so it seems, this poem seems uh, fitting and appropriate. Uh, Sex Without Love by Sharon Olds. How do they do it, the ones who make love without love? Beautiful as dancers gliding over each other like ice skaters, over the ice, fingers hooked inside each other's bodies, faces red as steak, wine, wet as the children at birth whose mothers are going to give them away. How do they come to the, come to the, come to the God, come to the still waters, and not love the one who came there with them, light rising slowly as steam off their joined skin? These are the true religious, the purists, the pros, the ones who will not accept a false messiah, love the priest instead of the God. They do not mistake the lover for their own pleasure. They are like great runners, they know they are alone with the road surface, the cold, the wind, the fit of their shoes, their overall cardiovascular health, just factors, like the partner in the bed and not the truth, which is the single body alone in the universe against its own best time. So next we have uh, David Landers who's taught literature of the English Renaissance at Berkeley since 2005. And he is currently completing a book on the silver and gold money of Renaissance literature. Please welcome him. <laughs> Thank you. This is the first Sestina written in the English language. Um, it's by Edmund Spencer. It, he inserted it into the August eclogue of the Shepherd's Calendar, um, his sort of manifesto for the refoundation of English poetry, which he published in 1579. Um, a sestina is a sort of medium short form. It's a virtuoso form. Um, it consists of six six-line stanzas, which don't employ rhyme, but instead repeat the terminal words of each of the first stanzas, six lines, in a different pattern, um, an intricate pattern that is dictated by the form um, and in the hands of a master, um, a pattern that is exploited rather than a pattern that is sort of, seems to force itself upon the poem. Um, and then there's a, se there's a seventh stanza in which uses half lines, um, still repeating the same six words. Um, in this poem, Spencer takes um, a relatively sort of familiar and even banal vocabulary of uh, you know, the complaint of the melancholy lover to the solitary woods in which he finds himself and which he has sought out. Um, and transforms that reading experience um, through a formal and technical virtuosity that is literally unprecedented in the English language, um, in that nobody had tried to do this before. Um, and that, to my mind, is still unsurpassed, but I'll let you be the judges of that. Ye wasteful woods, bear witness of my woe, wherein my plaints did oftentimes resound. Ye careless birds are privy to my cries, which in your songs were wont to make a part. Thou, pleasant spring, has oft lulled me oft asleep, whose streams my trickling tears did oft augment. Resort of people doth my griefs augment, the wallid towns do work my greater woe. The forest wide is fitter to resound the hollow echo of my careful cries. I hate the house, since thence my love did part, whose wailful want debars mine eyes from sleep. Let streams of tears supply the place of sleep. Let all that sweet is void, 
and all that may augment my dole draw near. More meet to wail my woe, being the wild woods my sorrows to resound, than bed or bower, both which I fill with cries, when I them see so waste, and find no part of pleasure past. Here will I dwell apart in gastful grove, therefore, till my last sleep do close mine eyes. So shall I not augment with sight of such a change my restless woe. Help me, ye baneful birds, whose shrieking sound is sign of dreary death, my deadly cries most ruthfully to tune. And as my cries which of my woe cannot be ray least part? You hear all night when nature craveth sleep. Increase, so let your irksome yells augment. Thus all the night in plaints, the day in woe, I vowed have to waste till safe and sound she home return, whose voices silver sound to cheerful songs can change my cheerless cries. Hence with the nightingale will I take part, that blessed bird that spends her time of sleep in songs and plaintive pleas, the more to augment the memory of his misdeed that wrought her woe. And you that feel no woe, when as the sound of these my nightly cries ye hear apart, let break your sounder sleep and pity augment. Vikram Chandram, I am also pleased to say, is no stranger to the microphone in the library. We welcomed here, him here many times. His latest work of fiction is Sacred Games, and he joined the English department in 2005. Um, talking about software, um, I was looking for this poem I'm going to read this morning and couldn't find it um, in any of my anthologies. And then, so of course, I did a Google search and came upon it instantly <laughs> <laughs> on a site called poetry something or the other dot com. And I was pleased to see that it, it got an 8.7 out of 10 rating from one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, of course, Dave wanted to know which were the poems that were more than 8.7. So I, <laughs> I plan to go back and do a query and see what pops up. I'm sure Kipling, as Dave pointed out, would be up there. Um, this is a poem by Robert Hayden, um, who's a poet who uh, was born in 1930 and died in 1980. Um, lived a lot in Detroit, was African-American. I'm drawn to him um, particularly because he was one of those people who faced the paradox of, of identification. Um, he refused to accept um, the, the, the label for himself, African-American poet. He always insisted on American poet and got in trouble in all kinds of ways for that. Um, but this poem <laughs> has been on my mind lot recently because my, my wife, Melanie, who you heard earlier, and I had a child 16 months ago, a little baby girl. And since then, I've been thinking a lot about my own parents. Um, this poem is called Those Winter Sundays. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in that blue back cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold, and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know, what did I know, of love's austere and lonely offices. Namwali Serpel joined the English department in uh, fall 2008. She works on 20th century and contemporary fiction and also on theories of reading. Please welcome Namwali. So I mostly work on narrative. Um, I always felt like trying to imitate poets or trying to capture what it feels like to read a poem 
It's like looking, trying to look someone in both eyes at once. You end up just staring at their nose. Um, and I feel um, privileged to be uh, asked to read a poem uh, since it's not quite my genre. Um, but speaking of uncertainty, I do work on uncertainty in narrative. Um, and this poem seems to me to have captured um, what I think about uncertainty, um, or perhaps more accurately, what I hope someday to believe about it. There's a precursor poem to Elizabeth Bishop's The Gentleman of Shalott, uh, which is uh, Tennyson's The Lady of Shalott. I'm not gonna impose uh, Tennyson on our time schedule today, um, but I will say that that poem is about um, a woman in a tower who's weaving, um, and she has a mirror in front of her loom so that she can see behind her through the window what's going on outside in Camelot. It's an Arthurian uh, legend. And uh, the crisis of the poem is when uh, she sees uh, Sir Lancelot in that mirror and decides to turn around and look. Um, and at that moment, she takes three paces across her small room and uh, the loom seems to explode and unravel and the mirror cracked from side to side. And this seems to be what uh, Elizabeth Bishop is taking up in her poem. Of the two, I think hers is the better half, so to speak. The Gentleman of Shalott. Which eyes his eye? Which limb lies next the mirror? For neither is clearer nor a different color than the other, nor meets a stranger in this arrangement of leg and leg and arm and so on. To his mind, it's the indication of a mirrored reflection somewhere along the line of what we call the spine. He felt in modesty his person was half looking glass, for why should he be doubled? The glass must stretch down his middle, or rather down the edge, but he's in doubt as to which sides in or out of the mirror. There's little margin for error, but there's no proof either, and if half his head's reflected, thought, he thinks, might be affected. But he's resigned to such economical design. If the glass slips, he's in a fix, only one leg, etc. but while it stays put, he can walk and run and his hands can clasp one another. The uncertainty he says he finds exhilarating. He loves that sense of constant readjustment. He wishes to be quoted as saying at present, half is enough. Mark Goble is associate professor of English and has taught here at Berkeley since 2008. He specializes in 20th century American literature and media studies. His forthcoming book, Beautiful Circuits, Modernism and the Mediated Life, will be published early next year by Columbia University Press. Mark, welcome. I'm gonna read two very short poems which I will minimally introduce so as to uh, keep on time. Uh, the first uh, is from Christian Bach's Eunoia. Eunoia is a word that means beautiful thinking, but more significantly for Christian Bach, it's the shortest word in the English language that contains all five vowels. And the framework of Eunoia is as a book in five chapters, each of which has a chapter that uses exclusively a single vowel, chapter A, E, and then this poem, which is the first, uh, the first section of chapter I. Writing is inhibiting. Sighing, I sit, scribbling in ink this pigeon script. I sing with nihilistic witticism, disciplining signs with trifling gimmicks, impish hijinks which highlight stick sigils. Isn't it glib? Isn't it chic? I fit childish insights within rigid limits, writing shtick which might instill priggish misgivings in critics blind with hindsight. I dismiss nitpicking criticism which flirts with philistinism. I bitch, I kibitz, <laughs> griping whilst criticizing dimwits, sniping whilst indicting nitwits, dismissing simplistic thinking, in which philippic wit is still illicit. <laughs> and just a, a second uh, short poem. Uh, I have a 10-day-old daughter at home. Uh, so, so in addition to this being the most number of words I've read in a consecutive period in a week and a half, uh, I've also spent a lot of time trying to put words in her head unsuccessfully. Uh, but I do find that these words will suffice. So this is a Tom Gunn's baby song. From the private ease of mother's womb, I fall into the lighted room. 
Why don't they simply put me back where it is warm and wet and black? But one thing follows on another. Things were different inside mother. Padded and jolly, I would ride the perfect comfort of her inside. They tuck me in a rustling bed. I lie there, raging small and red. <laughs> I may sleep soon, I may forget, but I won't forget that I regret. A rain of blood poured round her womb, but all time roars outside this room. <laughs> Thank you. So our final um, reader this um, afternoon is Emily Thornberry, who joined the English department in 2008. She specializes in English and Latin literature of England before the Norman Conquest and is teaching Old English this semester. She's currently writing a book called Becoming a Poet in Anglo-Saxon England. Please welcome Emily. Uh, so this is a bit of evangelism for my topic, but um, there's in Exeter Cathedral in Devonshire, um, there's a book of poetry that was ignored between about the year 1100 and about the year 1800. And in the back of the book are about 100 riddles. And the reason I like them is there's no solutions to them. And they, they ask you to fight with them. Um, I don't think I have time to read the Old English, so I'll just write you, read you roughly what the 39th riddle says. I know what I think it describes, but you can make up your own mind. This creature, books say, will for a long time be clear and evident among mankind. Its secret power is all the greater when men perceive it. It will seek out separately each one of the living and return again on its path. It is never there a second night, but eternally on an exile's track it must wander homeless, yet it's no more despised because of that. It has neither hand nor foot and never touches earth. It has not two eyes nor even one. It has no mouth and never speaks to men. It has no thought, and so they say it is the poorest of all creatures born in nature's course. It has neither soul nor breath, yet must endure far-flung journeys throughout this world of marvels. It has neither blood nor bone, yet becomes to many children a comfort throughout this earth. It never touched the heavens, nor can ever reach hell, but must live forever by the teaching of the King of Glory. It's very long to tell how the course of its life goes afterward. Its uneven dispensation of the fates is a marvelous thing to tell. All things that are told about this creature are true. It has no limbs, but lives nevertheless. If you can, with true words, tell the answer readily, then say what it is called. <laughs>